Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. The topic for today's webinar is solving the grid connection problem. This webinar is being presented by the Clean Energy States Alliance as part of our 100% Clean Energy Collaborative. We have a really exciting panel of speakers lined up to speak with you today. Before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over a few quick webinar logistics. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of the webinar. You can call in via telephone or connect using your computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled. You can also click on that orange arrow to maximize your or expand your webinar console. And one of the things you might like to do with your webinar console is submit questions and comments. We're going to save about 15 minutes at the end of our presentations for a Q&A with the audience and we will get to as many questions as we can so do type those in as you're thinking of them a final note this webinar is being recorded we'll send you an email probably tomorrow with a copy of the webinar slides and a link to the webinar recording and we'll also be posting all of those materials on our website cisa.org webinars that's a good url to know because it's also where we post all of our upcoming and archived webinars so with that, I will now pass it over to our moderator for today's webinar, my colleague, Ben Paulus. Ben is a senior research, senior research associate here at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and he will get us started. Over to you, Ben. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so the Clean Energy States Alliance is a consortium of state agencies that work to promote clean energy. Um, the, this webinar is brought to you by the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative, uh, which provides research and support for the states that have made commitments to all renewable or zero carbon power systems. You can get more information at this uh, address, csa.org slash 100, uh, where you can sign up for our emails, follow us on Twitter, read our reports and so on. Um, let's see, Sam, do I have control of the slides now? There we go. Um, here are some of the resources we have. We've been doing quite a bit of research about um, wholesale power markets, uh, how states are studying um, and planning to move toward 100% clean energy. We have um, guidelines or guides to the policies and legislation and regulations that states have been adopting and much more. Um, okay, so today uh, we're going to talk about the um, uh, the process of interconnection to the interconnecting to the power grid. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, four speakers: Joe Rand, Beth Solt, or three speakers: Joe Rand, Beth Solt, and Jeff Dennis, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Um, the follow the falling cost of renewable energy is resulting in rapid growth all around the world, as we know. In the U.S., new generators have to apply for connection to the grid uh, before they can start generating which triggers a review process by the grid operator to see if any upgrades are needed to allow that connection. Uh, the, the line of new resources that have applied for connection, especially solar, storage, and wind power, is enormous. Um, data from Berkeley Lab, which we will see in a, just a moment, shows that the capacity of proposed projects of proposed projects is actually greater than the capacity of current generators. Uh, supplying our electricity. So it's well over one terawatt of power. You don't often get to use that unit of measurement. Um, this huge surge of projects has really overloaded the interconnection process, uh, which has led to delays of many years to bring projects online, um, even if the projects have site control and, and contracts for their power sales. This results in higher costs and wasted money. Um, a, a growing number of uh, projects that fail due to the delay. Uh, it's a major impediment to achieving the 100% clean energy goals that many states have. Um, as a result, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC, is proposing a number of changes to the interconnection process that are intended to speed things up to lower costs and resu result in fewer project failures. We're going to hear today from three experts. Uh, Joe Rand is a senior associate with um, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. He'll be presenting the data on the interconnection queues to provide context on the nature of the problem. Uh, Joe's based in California. We'll then hear from Beth Soholt of the Clean Grid Alliance. Um, she'll share uh, what the dysfunctional queue means for clean energy developers and how they're responding to it. 
the Grid Alliance is a consortium of clean energy developers in the MISO footprint, mostly the upper Midwest. Uh, Beth has been the executive director there since its founding about 20 years ago. And then Jeff Dennis of Advanced Energy Economy, or AEE, will talk about what FERC is proposing. Uh, Jeff is the managing director and legal counsel uh, for AEE, and he previously spent 10 years on the staff at FERC. Um, lastly, we're going to have some discussion among the panelists um, about what the right solutions are and what also what you in the audience, what you can do as states and stakeholders to help fix the problem. If you have questions during the presentation, as Samantha mentioned, uh, please type them into the uh, questions box and we'll select some from the panelists uh, to discuss at the end of the webinar. So let's turn it over first to Joe Rand uh, with Berkeley Lab. Thanks, Ben. Um, so yeah, as, as Ben just said, I'll spend a few minutes here kind of setting the stage and outlining uh, some data that I think illustrate what we mean when we say that there's a grid connection problem. Um, so our, just to give a bit of background here, our team at Berkeley Lab has been collecting and compiling uh, and analyzing these data from transmission interconnection queues from all across the United States uh, for a number of years now. Um, but we're definitely seeing increasing interest and kind of urgency in understanding these data for a variety of reasons. I mean, first and foremost, we hear uh, from wind and solar and, and other clean energy project developers that interconnection issues have become one of the leading barriers to actually completing their projects. Um, and of course, at the same time, we have uh, renewed interest from FERC uh, and also the Department of Energy to address kind of these lingering structural and procedural issues uh, and to improve the interconnection process. So uh, you'll hear more um, from Jeff about the, the FERC uh, notice of proposed rulemaking on interconnection. On the DOE side, I wanna highlight uh, a new program called the Interconnection Innovation Exchange, uh, which is seeking to improve interconnection processes as well. Um, so just over the next few slides, I'll highlight some trends we're seeing as of the end of 2021. Um, so I haven't updated these through 2022 yet. Um, so we'll look at kind of the volume of different generation types in the queue, uh, the typical completion rates uh, for projects actually kind of working their way all the way through interconnection and actually reaching commercial operations. Um, and then I'll, uh, I have a slide also kind of highlighting the duration or the amount of time that it takes for a typical project to work its way through the queue. Um, so just as a quick bit of background for those who might not be totally familiar with the interconnection process, there's a really simplified diagram here that, that outlines what it typically might look like. So a developer would submit an interconnection request uh, and therefore enter the, the queue uh, and begin a series of interconnection studies. Um, again, those studies are designed to establish what kind of uh, local uh, point of interconnection and transmission upgrades would be required to connect that new generation um, and also assigns the cost of those upgrades. Now, typically those studies would culminate in an interconnection agreement, which is sort of a contract between the grid operator and, and the generation owner. Um, and then of course, as I'll highlight a little bit later, most of the projects that enter the queue are ultimately withdrawn at some point and never actually go on to, to be built. Um, but some fraction of them, roughly a quarter of projects entering the queue, um, ultimately do go on to reach commercial operations. Oops. Uh, go back. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is a, a slide, actually a, a figure that, that Ben Paulus helped us generate. So shout out to Ben uh, for that. And, and he mentioned it a little bit earlier, but it just um, illustrates the capacity that we see in the queue uh, shown here on the right hand side. And that's broken out, of course, by the different generation and storage types. Uh, and that's compared to the existing capacity or the full kind of US uh, you know, installed existing power fleet. Um, and what you see, it's astounding, is not only the change from 2010 to 2021, um, but more, more importantly, perhaps, that the, you know, the queue now represents more total capacity than the in installed uh, and operating power plant fleet in the United States. Uh, and again, probably most importantly, that the makeup of uh, you know, generation types in the queue is just fundamentally different from what we see uh, currently installed. Um, and to me, that just represents a clear indication of the major energy transition that, that is well underway here in the US. 
Now this figure shows the total capacity in the queues over time. Uh, it's in gigawatts uh, shown on the y-axis there. Uh, and here we've broken it out by generation type. And you can see that the total height of each bar um, actually represents the full cumulative capacity in the queues as of uh, that particular year. And the hatched portion of each bar represents a, um, the capacity that's in a hybrid configuration. So for example, with solar, those hybrid configurations typically would be paired with storage or possibly like a solar plus wind configuration. Now just general trends, we see explosive growth in solar and storage. Um, and definitely increasing interest in hybrid projects over time. Uh, in fact, as of 2021, over 40% of the solar capacity in the queues uh, was paired with storage. Now, proposed wind has uh, sort of flatlined, but still remains steady at over 240 gigawatts. Um, and you can definitely see proposed gas in the queues um, dropping pretty substantially since 2015, currently standing at about 75 gigawatts. All righty, and so now I'm kind of showing the same data, but I'm splitting it out by region instead of uh, by generator type, uh, although the generation types are, are still broken out by the different colors in this figure. Um, just looking across all these different regions, these uh, really highlight the seven ISO RTO regions across the US, as well as the West, which is a, a bunch of utilities not in, an, in, a, in a wholesale market, um, and the Southeast, the non-ISO region is also highlighted. Again, you can see solar and storage are just booming in nearly all regions. Um, uh, volume uh, in general is increasing across all RTOs, but um, you can really see PJM as a standout, having almost an order of magnitude more capacity than ISO New England, for example. Um, zooming out to look at all regions over here on the far right, you can see that required a different y-axis scale. Um, and I think this really just illustrates kind of this backlog that we talk about, um, just the sheer volume of capacity in the queue. You can see how much it's increased just since 2014. Now, as I mentioned, of course, not all of the projects in the queue actually uh, reach commercial operations. And that's illustrated here in this slide. Um, when we looked over time, just about 23% of all proposed plants that entered the interconnection queues actually uh, were built. Uh, we found wind and solar seem to have actually slightly lower completion rates over time uh, compared to other types, and especially compared to natural gas plants. And of course, on, on this uh, left-hand figure, you can also see these completion rates also vary not only over time, uh, but also um, across different regions. So the regions are kind of all these spaghetti lines in different colors. Um, no need to try to identify any particular one, but you can definitely see, you know, there, there are some substantial differences across the regions. And finally, um, I'll close by uh, just talking a little bit about the, the amount of time that it takes for projects to get through the queue. So um, uh, it definitely seems to be taking longer and longer for any typical kind of proposed project to work its way through this interconnection process. So this figure is charting the uh, duration from an interconnection request or when, when a project really enters the queue uh, all the way through um, to a, a completed and signed or executed interconnection agreement. So that doesn't mean that the project is actually online and operational providing power or, you know, they haven't even started construction, in fact. Um, it's just this is really kind of the, the interconnection study period that we're looking at. Um, certainly the duration is typical or median duration to complete that study process has fluctuated historically, um, but we can see a pretty steep increase since 2015. Um, and now uh, the typical project takes longer than ever. Uh, in fact, in 2021, a, a typical project would take over three years to go from that interconnection request to a signed interconnection agreement. Now, again, I want to highlight that this duration certainly varies by, you know, different RTOs, and we can talk a little bit more about that um, later. And, and, and I know that, you know, Beth, for example, will be uh, focused a lot on, on MISO today, for example. Um, uh, but I haven't shown all the different RTOs, but I do show kind of the, you know, uh, 25th to 75th percentile range, and you can see pretty much across the board, we're definitely seeing an increasing trend in that duration. So again, that points to this kind of backlog and uh, fundamentally kind of a, 
constrained transmission system and uh, perhaps a, a flawed interconnection process leading to not only the backlog in volume but also this kind of long delay uh, for projects to work their way through the queue. And with that, um, I am just going to highlight this link here uh, before I pass it off. Uh, if you want to learn more information about all the work Berkeley Lab is doing um, studying these interconnection queues, uh, you can go to this hyperlink. Um, uh, I also want to just reiterate uh, to check out the DOE's new program, Interconnection Innovation Exchange, or I2X. You can find that online as well. Uh, and I'll pass it on from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, we'll turn it over now to Beth Soholt with the Clean Grid Alliance. Uh, Beth's uh, camera is apparently not working, so we'll be able to see her slides and hear her, but uh, not be able to see her face. So take it away, Beth. Thank you, Ben. I'm so sorry about my camera. It's acting up this afternoon, um, but I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me um, and just doing a check that you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful, thank you. So my first couple of slides here are just a framing for the geography that we're going to be talking about. I know we have folks on the webinar from all across the country, um, and so I'll try to um, you know, generalize um, some of the things that I talk about, but the footprint that we work in is the orange mid-continent independent system operator. A reminder that the, the MISO goes really from uh, Manitoba, Canada, all the way down to a portion of Texas, and then Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, uh, into MISO South there. Um, and so uh, pretty big footprint in, in a good swath of wind and sun. So next slide. One of the most interesting things that just came out was uh, the Q submission that just closed on September 15th. So um, we saw uh, probably due to the IRA bill at the federal level and um, you know just the demand, the sheer demand for renewable and storage projects, a huge amount of megawatts get into the queue. So before uh, the close of the September 15th tranche, um, we the MISO Q had 118 gigawatts, 97% uh, of which was renewables and storage. As of September 15th, they got another 171 gigawatts, 96% uh, storage and renewables. So if all of those submissions are accepted, that brings the MISO Q to a whopping 289 gigawatts. And just a reminder that MISO's peak load is roughly 120 gigawatts-ish. Um, and so, uh, again, kind of the same observation as Joe, that we have more in the queues than installed generation today. But we are seeing the shift. If you look at the, the pie chart on the left of this slide, uh, you can see the kind of um, makeup, uh, the, the generation types that, that got into the queue on September 15th, really led by solar, um and then you know followed by storage hybrids and wind we are still seeing wind being developed in the west part of miso um but solar is coming on strong for a couple reasons uh we do have a lot of wind in miso um and so people are looking to kind of um round out their portfolios but also um because solar can get a, a higher capacity credit um and so when we look to replace uh, some of the um, meet some of the resource adequacy needs. Um, solar has a better profile to do that. So next slide, please. Please. So um, thinking about what MISO has done for the grid interconnection challenge and and for um, grid connections for. In the last 20 years since MISO was formed, um, they've gone through queue reform about five times. And the queue reform has had a variety of flavors. Um, the pushes have been around trying to shorten the timelines to, to meet you know, the challenge that Joe was talking about. And that's come in the form of um, you know, requiring people to be more ready before they get in the queue, have more land control, um, seeking higher deposits, um, making some deposits not refundable. Um, so there's been kind of these flavors of, of trying to 
help developers be more ready before they actually enter the queue so that you know you weed out some of the speculative speculative projects. MISO has also done more on the front end to um, help developers understand where there might be available transmission capacity um, or not. And we have seen really the queue over the last five years in particular um, shift from the West where we see a lot of uh, curtailment and a lot of congestion to the central region where there's a bigger load and and more available transmission capacity. So we've actually seen kind of a shift in <clears throat> location in the geography. Um, I would say that the, the things that MISO has tried to do are some of the same things that all of the RTOs and ISOs have tried to do with um, reforming the interconnection queues. But to talk about what the remaining key challenges are, and, and certainly um, the, the permit reform bill in Congress um, is aiming to fix some of these things. Um, but one of the big ones is really that uh, developers have to pay a lot of penalties. They have a lot of deadlines they have to meet, but there's no commensurate penalty on the utility transmission owner side for missing interconnection study deadlines. So um, we would really like to see some kind of um, reconciliation of that um, commensurate treatment with what developers have to do. And I know um, uh, somebody is going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, the other major thing that really is slowing down interconnection and, and um, grid connection is affected system studies on in the neighboring systems. And so SPP and PJM have to study, particularly along the seams, uh, for impacts to their systems from MISO located um, new generators. And they have been even slower than MISO. Uh, and so often MISO can finish their study group uh, and be waiting for SPP or PJM. So um, there are some uh, efforts underway to try to fix that. Um, SVP is going first. There's a, a joint targeted interconnection queue study that uh, SVP and MISO have been doing. Cost allocation will be a major factor with that, but, um, but at least there's work ongoing. We gotta get something on the PJM side. Um, another key challenge is the operating assumptions that MISO has been using for storage resources in the interconnection study. And so, um, you know, making storage be a solution, uh, how they look at, you know, how storage is going to operate, uh, that's been a key challenge. Um, and then just the sheer number of megawatts in the study groups, they require very large transmission solutions to solve. And so the models can run for days trying to search for, a, for an answer. Um, and so just the, the sheer number of megawatts makes it a difficult process. And then finally, cost allocation. Um, the JTIQ seam between, uh, or the, the seam study, but the seam between MISO and SPP, and then, um, you know, cost allocation in MISO South. Both of those are major challenges. So next slide, please. Um, so I didn't want to uh, kind of leave the problems on everybody's doorstep. I wanted to talk about, well, what are we doing about it and what can you do to help? Um, you know, clearly if states have clean energy goals, um, the grid needs to be ready to accept new generators interconnecting, uh, new renewables and storage. And we're not gonna get there unless we have the grid that, that can actually do that. So um, before I go there, let me just say, um, you know, what are developers doing on their side? Um, a couple of things are happening. Um, you know, we have a lot of curtailments and congestion on existing generators, renewables in MISO, particularly in the West where we have a severe lack of transmission. And so developers have to really um, figure out how much risk they're willing to take to move a new project forward if, there's, uh, if it's gonna be a while before there's new transmission. Um, curtailments are also a risk. And so, uh, you know, negotiating with the off taker about how that curtailment is going to be handled financially, who takes that risk, um, that's something they can do. Um, one trend we're seeing is the use of fossil resources like coal plant retirements and the infrastructure that's already there to um, 
to interconnect new renewables. Very promising trend. Um, and we've worked on a generator replacement policy and tariff changes at MISO to allow that to happen. I think that's happening in other parts of the, of the US as well. So um, that is a quicker cost-effective solution for interconnecting new generation. And then I would say grid enhancing technologies. We've got this gap between um, the new tranche of transmission that was just in, approved by the MISO Board of Directors that's not gonna be in service until 2028 to 2030. So what do we do in the meantime? Do we just stop uh, renewable development? No, we have to figure out you know, how can we keep going and, and what's a cost-effective and efficient way to do it? So certainly supporting new transmission that enables carbon reduction and, and states and utilities and customers and corporations to meet their, their goals um, is highly important. Really connecting the dots for people, educating, educating folks, whether it's a decision maker, it's an agency staff or the general public, why new infrastructure is needed um, and everything we, we do is gonna have a cost, but as compared to what, uh, we have to look at kind of the, uh, the apples to apples comparison. And then there really is a large gap in goals announced, goals and requirements and progress towards meeting them. So we really need to concentrate on implementation, implementing new transmission, implementing all these other stopgap measures and to be able to continue to deploy renewables and storage. Bottom line is the grid has to be ready to accommodate these, otherwise states cannot meet, um, otherwise you all cannot meet your goals. Uh, and so that's what keeps me up at night is, you know, how are we gonna get this big transition uh, done? And Clean Grid Alliance are, is working on this day in and day out. So um, we're right in the trenches. And then finally, I just wanted to go to my last slide and, uh, and with some good news, um, on July 25th, the MISA Board of Directors did approve the next large tranche of, tr tranche of transmission, $10.3 billion worth for 18 projects that is going to be um, broadly cost shared across the, uh, the classic part of MISO um, in the, um, the west, central and east um, zones. And you can see that, uh, you know, the, the new, transmission is kind of spread all across the footprint. And so it is really, um, it is it was really studied and developed to meet the needs of the, the goals that have already been announced by utilities. And so, you know, this is the very first uh, tranche. We're, we're gonna be doing another tranche in, in 2023, and then we're looking at tranches three and four, which will have some, connectivity between MISO North and MISO South. Um, but this is really uh, the first bite at the apple for, um, for doing this transition to the future that everybody has announced. Uh, so that's the good news. Um, there's a lot of work to get all these lines through the state regulatory process, but at the very heart of the, the grid connection problems, it's a fundamental lack of transmission problem. And so the, these, these new 18 transmission lines will enable, you know, probably in the neighborhood of 30, 40, 50 gigawatts of new renewables uh, provide uh, reliability, resilience, uh, and other um, attributes and services for the region. So we're very happy that MISO is at this point. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over uh, back to you, Ben. Hey, thank you, Beth. <clears throat> uh, we're going to turn now to Jeff Dennis with Advanced Energy Economy uh, to talk about what uh, FERC is proposing to do in the in interconnection reform. Thanks, Ben, and um, thanks to everyone, uh, all the panelists, and to everyone for joining us today. Uh, just quickly, if you don't know who we are, Advanced Energy Economy is a national association of businesses, multi-technology in nature. Uh, all committed to a 100% clean electricity system. 
and 100% electrification of transportation buildings and other uh, end uses. And so our members range from large renewable developers to uh, developers of distributed energy resources, electric vehicles, as well as large corporate buyers of clean energy are all in, um, in our membership. And so that's the perspective I'll be bringing today. Um, and as Ben mentioned, I'm going to provide a, a, a hopefully short overview of what it, um, FERC has proposed in its recent notice of proposed rulemaking on improving generator interconnection procedures and agreements to really address some of those challenges that Beth uh, just mentioned uh, and that Joe uh, mentioned before. So what is FERC's NOPER, uh, I'll use that acronym a lot, I apologize. Uh, I worked at FERC for too long, so uh, do use those NOPERs, but, or do use that NOPER um, uh, acronym. But uh, what, what FERC is proposing to do is change its regulations and in particular change the pro forma interconnection procedures and pro forma generator interconnection agreement in those regulations. These pro forma procedures and agreements are the minimum requirements that FERC imposes on all jurisdictional uh, transmission providers, so all that they regulate. And they literally, uh, under FERC's rules, uh, have to be adopted word for word um, in those transmission providers' tariffs, unless they seek um, a deviation from those pro forma agreements. And typically, in order to do that, if you are not a regional transmission organization, uh, you need to show that those um, proposed changes are consistent with or superior to what's in the pro forma connect, uh, agreement and procedures. So that's why I say they're kind of minimums. The NOPER proposals generally fall into four buckets of reforms I've listed there. And, um, initial comments are due in just a couple of weeks, actually, uh, with reply comments due in mid-November. So um, now is definitely the time to get your views into FERC on these proposed changes. And um, that's certainly something uh, at a very high level that I would suggest that all states do is study this um, and definitely get your comments in. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to go ahead and um, move to the next slide um, and start talking about those four buckets of reforms that I talked about or, or that I listed on that um, on that previous slide. The first set of reforms are really process reforms intended to speed from the existing process today uh, to one that is much more efficient and moves much more quickly in the future. So today, in most, but not all regions of the country, but in most regions of the country, the process is serial in nature and it is first come, first serve. Your interconnection request is processed based on when you got in line. Um, and what that does is it tends to create interdependence between interconnection requests in the queue. If I'm first in the queue and Beth is second, the, gener the um, network upgrades that I may need to construct in order to bring my generating project online could then support bringing Beth's project online. But if I drop out of the queue, then Beth's project has to be restudied. And so this is the interdependence that we're talking about. Um, and what FERC is proposing is to move away from this first come, first serve process to a cluster-based, first ready, first served approach. And so what that would do first and foremost is instead of this sort of we go in line in order of when you came in the queue, it would group interconnection requests received during submission windows and study them together. This is the best practice that we've seen adopted in other places in the country. Uh, KISO in particular uses a um, cluster study process, but others do as well. Um, that also allows both the cost of the studies that need to be conducted of those generator connections and the network upgrade cost um, to prepare the grid to interconnect all of those generators in the cluster can be shared. And that is intended to address another problem, which is that generators earlier in the, the current serial queue may be assigned a large set, a large and costly set of transmission upgrades in order to interconnect their project to the grid. Um, but those uh, interconnection uh, or those upgrades they may make 
may also benefit generators behind them, close behind them in the queue. And so this allows for those costs to be shared among generators within, um, within that cluster. It is not a perfect solution to that problem uh, of the high cost of generator connection. I'm certainly happy to talk about kind of maybe what's missing from FERC's proposal to address that request, uh, that problem, um, but certainly is something that would help. Secondly, this first ready uh, or this readiness concept that FERC is proposing to implement would require that generators demonstrate readiness to join the queue and to remain in a cluster for study. And this is intended to address what FERC says are speculative interconnection requests, clogging interconnection queues. Uh, and then dropping out at some point. So these are projects that may not have much commercial viability in FERC's, uh, in FERC's view, uh, but are coming into the queue anyway. Um, so this is intended to, to, um, to limit the potential for speculative requests. Um, FERC's proposal includes increased the study deposits um, to get in the queue with more of those deposits at risk, meaning non-refundable, uh, in the form of penalties if a generator withdraws. And those go up as you stay longer in the queue. Um, and then there is also a specific requirement to demonstrate uh, or propose this, a, a specific requirement to demonstrate, quote, commercial readiness. Um, and FERC identifies a few ways in which you can demonstrate commercial readiness in order to enter a cluster study. Uh, you can submit an executed term sheet for the facility or for sale of energy capacity and ancillary services from the facility. Uh, you can provide reasonable evidence that you've been selected in a resource plan, an integrated resource plan, or, or a state solicitation process. Uh, if you're develop being developed by a load serving entity, or if you're intended to be sold uh, to a large CNI customer. Um, and FERC also notes that the filing of a, of a large generator connection agreement with the commission with a commitment to construct the facility um, could also be used to demonstrate commercial readiness. You know, I'll note here that certainly our members are looking at these requirements carefully um, to make sure that they match both the commercial reality of how projects are developed and also the commercial reality of different regions of the country. Um, while certainly in some regions, uh, selection in a resource solicitation plan or in an IRP um, is significant evidence of commercial readiness. In other markets, you can be commercially ready to go without those kinds of things. You can sell into the open RTO market. And so um, we're currently considering how to bring some of those considerations to the commission uh, to improve this part of their proposals. Next slide, please. Now, of course, speeding the interconnection queue isn't just about um, making sure that generators face more stringent requirements to enter and stay in the queue, um, but also about making sure that transmission providers, when I talk about transmission providers, I'm talking about both regional transmission organizations and individual transmission owners, meet their obligations to process interconnection queue requests in a timely manner. And so FERC has some proposals here as well. It is proposing more stringent requirements on um, those transmission providers to process interconnection studies on time. Currently, FERC only uh, applies a, a flexible and somewhat amorphous reasonable effort standard, which basically requires transmission providers to use, as it says, reasonable efforts to process interconnection queues with diligence. Uh, but no real firm deadlines, and to our understanding, uh, no transmission provider has ever been found to not have used reasonable efforts, despite the significant delays that FERC itself identifies uh, in studies around the country. And so those would be replaced with firm deadlines under this proposal, along with penalties for failure to meet those deadlines. In addition, um, again, to kind of address some of the resource or the information gaps that generators often find themselves in, and those information gaps that might cause them to submit an interconnection request um, in order to get information they don't otherwise have. FERC has a couple of proposed new obligations on transmission providers to address those information gaps as well, and to provide more information to assist customers. One is to provide interconnection customers, generators, with the option um, to request an informational interconnection study. Um, this looks a lot like, to me at least, looks a lot like a hosting capacity analysis for those of you that are familiar with that on the distribution side. But really, it's an opportunity 
for a generator to come to the transmission provider and ask for a study of a location without inter without actually entering the queue, uh, clogging the queue, and you know, um, uh, suffering the risk of you know submitting that deposit, not getting it back, et cetera. And there's also uh, a proposed requirement to allow a resource planning entity. So that could be a load serving entity like a utility, or it could be a state like all of you to request a resource solicitation study. For example, the study of a, of a portfolio of resources in an integrated resource plan to get a sense of what the interconnection costs would be. Um, and you know, the entity, whether it's a state or a utility could ask for different combinations of resources to be studied to inform that integrated resource planning process. Um, I would note that to avoid undue discrimination, FERC proposes to require that resource plans use competitive procurement practices or be subject to review by a state agency. Um, and our members are looking closely at that too, to ensure that there would not be sort of a, uh, undue discrimination for utility driven projects, uh, as opposed to projects that may be independently developed, maybe developed for corporate customers, things like that. Um, Beth talked about the problem of affected system studies, right? Uh, that, that need to study your neighbor's system for impacts on that system. Um, FERC is proposing a new set of pro forma procedures to guide those studies because today there is no consistency between regions, as Beth pointed out. And so to address that, FERC is proposing a new process to guide those kinds of studies uh, on affected systems. Next slide, please. Finally, Beth mentioned uh, some of this as well, but um, FERC also proposes a number of um, process improvements uh, to incorporate uh, technology advancements. Uh, and these are really important parts of FERC's proposal. So first, to better accommodate hybrid resources, and when we talk about hybrid resources, we're talking about you know, solar and wind combined with storage, uh, typically is what we're talking about. Um, these proposals would require transmission providers to allow multiple resources to interconnect behind a single point of interconnection using a single interconnection request and agreement. There have been circumstances in which transmission providers have, have required um, separate interconnection agreements and reviews of each individual resource behind a single point of interconnection. This would uh, provide another option for a single study and a single agreement. Also, um, FERC would require transmission providers to allow the addition of resources to an interconnection request um, without changing the requested level of service. In other words, the requested amount of megawatts I want to input into the system um, without losing your queue position. Today, if you have, let's say, a solar or wind project in the queue and you want to add storage to it because the economics of storage have gotten so much better. Um, there's now new tax credits available for storage and you want to firm your output a little bit. Um, you would have to lose your queue position and go back to the start of the process. So this would eliminate that as well. Another problem that Beth mentioned that FERC proposes to address is requiring transmission providers to use realistic operating assumption, assumptions around combinations of wind or solar and storage at a single site. So today we see instances where transmission providers take the megawatts of a wind project and the megawatts of a storage project at the same site that are operating together and add them together and require that they be studied at that combined amount. When in reality, that project will uh, never likely operate both the solar asset and the storage asset at the same time. Typically, when the solar is at full output, it's, it's charging the storage, and the storage is discharging at times when the solar is not available at night on a cloudy day. Um, and so transmission providers would have to accept those kinds of real, realistic operating assumptions from interconnection customers when they submit their interconnection request. Um, to Beth's point about grid enhancing technologies and other things that we can do, besides simply building new large transmission to accommodate interconnection, um, the FERC's proposal would require the transmission providers give customers the option to study these alternative technologies. Uh, and they are listed here. 
um, but advanced power flow controls, dynamic line ratings, things that can be done to uh, increase the capacity of the existing system short of building new hard infrastructure. Um, and then finally, there's also a requirement for generators to submit operational data and demonstrate their capability to ride through grid disturbances. This is intended to address some problems that NERC and others have identified um, of certain technologies tripping offline during these kinds of uh, typically um, low voltage events um, and transmission operators not having a good sense of when that's going to happen. Um, as solar and wind and those technologies become a bigger part of our mix, operators need to have a better um, understanding um, and visibility into their operational um, parameters and when they can expect that they will go offline. And also for them to start operating um, um, equipment that they have to be able to ride through grid disturbances. Um, so that's another part of FERC's proposal as well. Um, so last slide, um, for more information, we have published um, a short summary explainer of FERC's proposal, um, boiled down a few hundreds of pages into about 12. Um, with references to paragraph numbers in the um, in the actual NOPR itself. So if you want a little bit of a cheat sheet, quick guide to, um, to FERC's proposals, uh, you can find it uh, on AE's website. Um, thanks to our terrific team uh, at AE for putting that together. And I will turn it back to Ben. Uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Yes, we've um, been getting a number of questions through the uh, questions box. Really, the, the main question coming in is why why what is causing the delays is it a lack of resources at the rtos is it defects in the application review process is it a lack of capacity on the grid um, is it better to have uh, process improvements or do we need just technical solutions like those grid enhancing technologies um, <clears throat> uh, like joe do you want to chime in on that yeah sure i mean I, I hate to say this, but it's really all of the above. Um, I know that's kind of a non-answer, but um, yeah, the truth is it's it's not, there's not a simple solution, you know, not, not a simple technological solution. Um, there's certainly not a simple process only solution. Um, you know, Ben, you pointed out a number of the, the key issues that folks have identified. I mean, there's workforce kind of staffing, shortage of engineering staff at, at some of the um, entities that are conducting these interconnection studies. Um, you know, others on the panel today have spoken about just fundamental constraints of the transmission system. I think, you know, that if there were kind of one thing to point out, um, maybe that's kind of the, the simplest thing. If we were to kind of expand, uh, uh, you know, our transmission network, um, that would make some of this easier. But, you know, doing that alone without some kind of procedural um, efficiency improvements, um, um, uh, you know, wouldn't be sufficient either. So yeah, I really view it as, you know, not not kind of any silver, you know, there's no silver bullet, um, but yeah, it's really kind of an all of the above approach. And I, I will say that I think that's to some degree what FERC has proposed here. Um, you know, you don't see just a, a simple kind of procedural tweaks in this NOPR. Um, and especially when you consider this NOPR, not in isolation, but um, kind of as a, a one-two punch with the transmission planning NOPR that came out just a couple of months earlier. Um, yeah, I don't know if others on the panel have additional thoughts to add. You know, I just quickly, I agree with everything that Joe said, and I, I I would pick up where he left off with FERC's transmission planning and cost allocation NOPR that came out several months earlier because um, while much of what's in FERC's proposal, uh, it will take positive steps forward, um, there is no, the, the first and the best method to resolve these processes is to build more needed regional transmission that takes into account the drivers of these the, um, these increases in in um, in requests to interconnect to the grid, um, you know, and that's state policies, that's electrification of end uses, that's customer demand, all of these things. And FERC is really proposing to make sure that transmission planning does a better job of incorporating all of those things, um, so that because what where we are today is the generator interconnection process is kind of subbing in for a good regional transmission planning process. And we're seeing too much large transmission try to get spit out of this process. 
and that's just that's just adding to the backlogs that we're seeing. So, um, you know, the first remedy is is good transmission planning that that proactively looks at these increases in generation because um, while we want these processes, these interconnection processes to move faster, um, we don't want to just shrink the queue for the sake of shrinking the queue. We know we're going to have a lot more projects coming. Um, and so we really need to think holistically about solutions. And, and Ben, I would just uh, chime in and agree with both, both Jeff and Joe, but I guess if I had to pick just a couple of things, I think that we're making progress, at least in MISO, uh, on deciding what to build and where to build it for transmission. I think one of the hardest things that we still have to do more work on is cost allocation and who pay, the who pays question. You know, everything in life comes down to money, or a lot of things do, and and economics, and um, uh, making sure we can load in sufficient additional benefit metrics to really capture the value that transmission is providing writ large to everyone, and then have everyone recognize, um, you know, that everybody is trying to make this large change. Um, and if you want to drive an electric vehicle and uh, have you know, long haul truckers be driving electric vehicle vehicles and electrify buildings, you know, everybody needs more grid on a different grid. So um, I think cost allocation is is one of the major challenges. Uh, and then I would just say, you know, the RTOs and ISOs are not immune to the workforce challenges that are going on. Uh, I know MISO is spending a lot of time looking at culture and and you know what is really um, causing the churn in their workforce, and you know trying to be more intentional about um, making it a good place to work, but. Um, Fundamentally, we just, we need more grid. Yeah, <clears throat> follow the money. Uh, as they say about water in the West, water flows uphill toward money. Um, <laughs> uh, another question um, from the audience. Um, are there RTOs that are doing, you would think, an especially good job on queue management or especially bad job? Um, and are there current best practices that we can point to that should be universal? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take the first crack again, but I, I'm sure my, my co-panelists will have, you know, plenty to add. Um, you know, again, uh, you know, I think one of the interesting things that we've seen um, with interconnection procedures, if we look across RTOs even, and let's not even count all the kind of non-ISO utilities, um, is we do see, you know, just fundamentally different processes across, you know, the, the various RTOs in the U.S. and um, that has led, of course, to fundamentally different outcomes. And Beth highlighted some of the reforms that MISO has made over the past you know, decade or so to their interconnection process. I think that's certainly led to some improvements, whereas other places like PJM you know, uh, still <laughs> do this serial first come, first serve process that um, has led, if you saw in the data that I shared, if you looked and zoomed into PJM, you know, just this extraordinary backlog uh, of projects. Um, and so maybe I'm just saying PJM might be kind of a worst case scenario right now where their backlog is really bad and they've actually um, uh, requested a two year pause on all new interconnection requests uh, to, to address that uh, while simultaneously reforming their process. On the flip side, then we have um, areas like, you know, maybe California ISO and ERCOT that maybe are uh, doing a slightly better job from the developer's standpoint of, of, um, of processing projects. And um, that, you know, I think for, um, in both of those cases that I highlighted, maybe doing you know, a pretty good job, um, you know, their, their cost allocation um, and approach to participant funding is fundamentally different than, than other RTOs. So ERCOT, for example, um, you know, really doesn't charge any network upgrade costs to the generator. Um, that's all kind of wrapped into the transmission planning process in ERCOT. Um, it's a different process. Um, I think some generators, you know, uh, really, really like that and feel like it's kind of more predictable for them there. Um, but it's hard to, hard to say that anyone is doing it perfectly on the other. 
Yeah, and Ben, I would just um, add, you know, I, I talked about the improvements that MISO has made over the years, and, and we've worked hard on those with them to, to try to get them to be more progressive. Um, I just want to uh, tack on to one thing Joe said, and that is, you know, in MISO, we've got this construct for transmission and who pays, you know, that we're trying to surgically determine is this line for reliability and i know there's that you know there's steady work to back this out up but is it for reliability is it for generator interconnection is it for congestion relief is it for economic markets is it for so so we're trying to put this kind of human construct on a uh you know electrons that want to flow the way they want to flow and and i think that if we had one comprehensive transmission planning process that that loaded in all of the considerations rather than trying to um kind of surgically do this it, we might be better but i'm not i'm not sure we're ever going to get there but hopefully we could get a little bit closer by um by loading in some of those other benefit metrics so so that we can take um more things into consideration rather than less and and so i think we're just we're trying to wrap ourselves around the axle a little bit to determine kind of the who pays question mm -hmm. well, only thing i would add is i would agree with joe that that pjm has really been been the biggest challenge across the country and and one one aspect i would highlight there is that you know there have been pretty chronic delays in, in getting studies done in that process. Um, and those delays are on the part of both PJM itself, but also on the individual transmission owners within PJM who also have, um, who have obligations to, to in, in the study process. I think that's important for states to know. I, I think that's something that, you know, you can ask your utilities, what resources are you putting to this? Do you need more resources? Um, because this is ultimately affecting uh, the achievement of your state's policy goals. Yeah. All right, we, we have just a couple minutes left and one maybe final question. Um, an audience member pointed out that uh, there's a very large amount of storage, battery storage proposed in all of the queues across the country. Um, and storage uh, can be could be used as a way to reduce congestion and reduce the need for grid upgrades. Uh, a lot of these projects are, are retrofits at existing solar generators, especially in some wind. Um, so the question was, how is how is storage viewed in the interconnection process? How is it studied, um, and how can it be a way to uh, to ease the queue process? Any ideas? Yeah, I can I can start. Um, we have a I, I would say across the country we still have a large amount of work to do to incorporate storage into our um, into our generation portfolio and 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 as a transmission solution as well. You know, in MISO, the what I call the rules of the road for storage are still in progress. We don't know exactly how it's going to be used, exactly what kind of revenue streams uh, or attributes MISO is going to value from storage. And, and so um, while we see an enormous amount of megawatts in the queue, the, you know, the marketplace is reacting to what they know we need because we need to pair renewables with storage to make, um, you know, to meet our resource adequacy needs. Um, but the work we're 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 kind of halfway done with the work to really understand and utilize storage to the amount that it's it's going to need to be utilized. So um, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but there are specific things that we're working on in both the interconnection and just generally kind of new market products and services, kind of an attribute conversation. And so. Um, we have a lot of work to do on storage. Uh, Joe or Jeff, any further thoughts on that? I, I could just jump in quickly and say like, yeah, I mean, it's certainly storage um, in in many cases could be a, a kind of a proxy for transmission, but it's not a perfect substitute. I mean, storage can do things that transmission can't do and vice versa is also true. 
Um, so I think even, you know, if you look at all the models for kind of decarbonization scenarios, you know, even with aggressive deployment of, of electric storage, you know, we still need massive uh, increase in the deployment of, of, of transmission. <laughs> and so uh, it's not like we can kind of get around that transmission need by just building more and more storage. Um, I think that fundamentally that, that need is still going to be there. Um, and I guess the last thing I would say, just to speak, kind of Beth was talking about new market products. And yeah, I think that's a really important point too. And that, you know, um, you know, I'm not sure the extent that states could kind of influence that, but single state RTOs like California ISO have definitely started implementing some of those new market products, um, whether they're kind of more ancillary services or, you know, California has what they call a flexible ramping product that can um, really incentivize um, uh, electric storage to, to provide power at that peak moment when, you know, solar is kind of ramping down the, you know, the, the duck curve issue in California. So um, definitely, I think, you know, the, there's a, a role for, um, in this case, kind of not just kind of procedural or regulatory reform, but, you know, to some degree market reform that, that could enable that uh, and unlock uh, some of the benefits of storage. All right, very good. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, I think we have one last slide here. There we go. Um, thank you for, um, and thank you for the audience for attending. Um, as we said, the, um, uh, as Samantha said, we're going to be emailing out to the all, all the audience attendees um, links to the slides and to the recording of the webinar. Uh, you can learn more about the 100% Clean Energy Collaborative from CESA at cesa.org slash 100. Uh, research, uh, email lists, um, and other data. Um, please follow along and uh, get in touch and let us know what you're doing in your state to help us reach these 100% goals. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, Joe Rand from Berkeley Lab, Beth Soholt from Clean Grid Alliance, and Jeff Dennis from Advanced Energy Economy. Um, and thank you all for attending. Take care.